Thank you all. Uh, once again, my name is Sheila Shao, and I am an organizer with Pivot to Peace. And today's webinar is titled Chinese Americans United Against the New Cold War. I want to give a special thanks to our sponsors today. Um, our first sponsor is the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association of San Francisco, which is one of the oldest family associations built by the Chinese American community during the height of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And then our second sponsor is uh, Chinese for Affirmative Action, CAA, a community-based civil rights organization fighting for social justice issues since 1969, specifically around racial equality and economic justice for all Americans. It really means a, a great deal for us here at Pivot to Peace that we have the support of these amazing organizations that are rooted in the Chinese American community. Today's Pivot to Peace webinar is an important American lesson for all of us. The Chinese American community will be sharing a voice of urgency with the American mainstream community. It is a voice that does not often get out to the larger community. Chinese Americans as a group are undergoing a very difficult time. We are living through a US-China Cold War. Our experience is unique and really it must be told. And so people who are not Chinese ethnically, nationally, or Chinese American are really not aware, or can they be aware about what Chinese people are thinking and feeling, especially as tensions rise between US and China. Today, respected leaders of the Chinese American community will put these experiences in a historical, political, and personal context to educate the public about the effects of the US-China Cold War on Chinese Americans. In the last two years since President Trump started the trade war, there was a constant barrage of negative headlines and stories about China. And the effects of some of these headlines from the media has had devastating negative effects on the Chinese psyche. Here's an example from the front page of the much respected foreign affairs magazine. Quote, how China threatens American democracy, Beijing's ideological agenda, agenda has gone global, end quote. When Americans who are not Chinese read the headline or hear a headline like it on television, they might just simply think about US diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China. When they hear the president of the US say things like China is stealing our jobs, they might think of it from a point of view of the economic relationship um, between the Chinese government and US government and US corporations. When Americans who are not Chinese read a story about the FBI arresting a, a Chinese scholar as a possible spy, they might wonder about whether the US-Chinese relations are deteriorating even more than, say, a year ago. But when you are Chinese American, when you're a Chinese American person and you read these headlines and hear the comprehensive, almost overwhelmingly negative coverage um, of China, you don't think about it as something far away. You don't think of it as simply uh, as a relations between two countries. If you're Chinese, you think of it from a very personal way. How will this growing atmosphere of hostility to the Chinese government impact me? How will it impact my family and children? Will they encounter comments or negative attitudes, uh, bullying from classmates in school? Will they and their family members be looked upon in a certain way with suspicion? In other words, for Chinese Americans and the Chinese community here in the US, especially given the long history in the US of fierce racism directed against our community, which included the, pro the prohibition of Chinese Americans becoming citizens, which included the Chinese Exclusion Act, which included the lynchings of Chinese laborers that took place in different states across the country, when you know, as all of us who are not simply Chinese, but also East Asian descent, uh, about how Japanese Americans were rounded up and put into concentration camps, when the US-Japanese confrontation devolved into military conflict. So when you know things that only we can feel, then you won't appreciate how the Cold War against China is also a racist war against Chinese people, Chinese Americans, and Asian Americans as well, as collateral damage inside the US. In other words, when it comes to China, 
Uh, U.S. policy is not simply foreign policy, but for us, it is a fundamental domestic policy. It affects our homes, our schools, our places of business. As we promote peace, we want all Americans who care about peace to understand how we think and how we feel. We want everyone to have a better appreciation of what this Cold War means to us and the cost of war to our communities. Fighting for peace is also fighting for justice. It also means building a bridge between people and countries. That, in short, is why we think this webinar today is so important to the welfare of this country. So without further ado, I'd like to begin this webinar. We have five speakers with us today. We have Ling Chi Wang, a professor emeritus of Asian American Studies and Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley. We have Lillian Singh, the first Asian American female judge in Northern California. We have Henry Durr, the former executive director of the San Francisco-based uh, Chinese for Affirmative Action, which is also our sponsor. We have George Ku, a retired international business advisor. And finally, we have Julie Tang, a retired judge of San Francisco Superior Court and former assistant district attorney. So first, I would like to introduce Professor Ling Chi Wang. Uh, again, he is a professor emeritus of Asian American Studies and Ethnic Studies at the University of California, Berkeley in the last five decades. He is also the co-founder of the Chinese uh, for Affirmative Action, a community-based civil rights organization that works with other minority groups in promoting racial equality and economic justice for all Americans. He has been a strong advocate of bilingual education and rights of linguistic minorities throughout the US. He also co-founded the International Society for the Study of Chinese Overseas in 1992. So Professor Ling Chi Wang, as a lifelong educator and leader in the Chinese American community, can you start off our panel discussion with a background of this new Cold War with China and the implications it has on Chinese Americans? Thank you very much for including me in this important panel discussion on our new Cold War against China and its implications on the rights and welfare of Chinese Americans. Let me first talk briefly about America's new Cold War against China, when and how it began in recent years, and why both China and the United States, and for that matter, the world, can ill afford to let it, let it turn into a military confrontation, you know, like a hot war. And then I will talk only very briefly for the remaining minutes how the new Cold War against China affect Chinese Americans because other speakers after me will have more to say about it. So let's begin with the new Cold War against China. Most Americans are familiar with the, Cold, the old Cold War, which occurred during the second half of the 20th century between two camps the Eastern Bloc pop and the Western Bloc, popularly known as the two sides of the Iron Curtain. And of course, the Eastern Bloc was led by the former Soviet Union and the Western Bloc by the United States, both possessing mutually assured destruction by nuclear weapons. And that's why we were, they were able to avoid, you know, a nuclear holocaust. China was viewed during that time as a, um, in the West, as an ally of the Soviet Union in the 1950s, even though there were mounting ideological disputes and occasional border scrimmages between them, resulting in fact in the split, the Sino-Soviet split in early 1960s. It was called the Cold War because there was no direct confrontation uh, in, in between the United States and USSR. Instead, there were plenty of ideological and political conflict or war of propaganda between capitalism and communism and between democracy and authoritarians. These all have implications for you know, what we're going to talk about, about the new Cold War. As we all know, the old Cold War ended in 1989, 1990. President George Bush 
you know, promise a new world order and peace dividend. Political scientist Francis Fukuyama declared victory for liberal capitalist democracy and the end of history. What followed was, of course, the, the spectacular breakup of the Soviet Union into several new countries in Eastern Europe and steady expansion of NATO into Eastern Europe, provoking, of course, suspicion and alarm in Russia and worse, mounting tension between Russia and the United States, a subject, of course, not within the purview of today's discussion. While all eyes were on Europe, a new development of great geop geopolitical significance was taking place in East Asia. I'm referring to the concurrent and rapid ascendancy of China as a global economic power after the old Cold War and the relative decline of the United States as an economic and political power. The source really, that is really the source of the new Cold War against China. The new Cold War is rooted, unfortunately, in false assumptions and unrealistic expectations held by the United States and our willingness and our, rather, and our unwillingness to accept China as China's inevitable rise and to treat China as our equal with respect that it justly deserves. To put it in another way, we are the so we are um, we are so used to being the number one, the big brother, the most powerful country in the world since the end of uh, World War II, that we simply cannot accept China. Uh, China's uh, rise, you know, the new kid on the block, Donald Trump's campaign to make America great again is in fact the perfect example of our, our need to be on top of the world. And the head honcho, the dominant military, economic, and po political power of the world. What of course is going to us is the speed of China's economic rise and how China and the United States are mutually and economically dependent on each other. There are many ways of measuring the rise and decline of a country. By far, of course, the most common measurement, but not necessarily the most accurate measuring yardsticks is, of course, the annual GDP, the gross domestic product of a country. China's GDP grew about 27-fold in the first 20 years after the Cold War. After the Cold War. Um, surpassing first, you know, the number four United Kingdom in 2008, and then number three, Germany, and number two, Japan in 2009. China is now running neck to neck with, with the uh, number one United States, a position we occupy since the end of World War II. Some economists even think China has already surpassed the United States, especially in the, you know, after the devastating economic blow due to this year's coronavirus pandemic. However, if we were to measure the standard and quality of living, the military power, the technological advancement, the financial assets, China is easily decades behind the United States. What is important to keep in mind is the fact that China managed to grow rapidly without invading, conquering, colonizing, and exploiting any country and without establishing hundreds of intimidating military bases throughout the world like the United States have been doing. At home, even more impressive is China's success in reducing illiteracy from 85% in 1990 to zero today, creating the world's largest middle class and lifting some 800 million people from abject poverty in unprecedented speed and magnitude the world had ever seen. 
it is now on track to reach its national goal of eliminating poverty altogether within the next few years. In short, among the third world countries, especially Af those countries in Africa and Latin America, China has become metaphorically the city on the hill and the inspiration and hope for the underdeveloped countries throughout the world. To me, the realization that China was going to overtake us cannot be tolerated by us. This is what irks the United States. It is the fear of losing our number one position in the world. The flip side of China's rise, unfortunately, is been equated, therefore, with the fear and threat of China. We suddenly came to the realization sometime, sometime during the second term of President Obama with Hillary Clinton as the Secretary of State. The fear is based not just on our ignorance of China, but also our false assumptions that a strong China would do exactly the same thing we have been doing throughout our history. And that is, China will seek expansion, conquest, domination, explo exploitation, and appropriation of what justly belong to others. Therefore, we must immediately take decisive steps to stop and reverse the rise of China. Hence, we have the now the new and, uh, and still not quite fully formulated policy toward China we now call, we, we then call pivot to Asia, or in other words, really what we're talking about is a new Cold War against China. Now, foreign policies, as uh, Sheila mentioned earlier, have very significant domestic consequences, especially in domestic race relations. And then also domestic race relations uh, oftentimes shape our foreign policy. So where there is, you know, sometimes tensions, like in the 19th century, tension between uh, the white and the Chinese American immigrants, you know, it influenced our policy for China. And that's how, what she had mentioned earlier, the 1882 Chinese exclusion law got passed. In fact, you know, that one is only one of the 15 Chinese exclusion law enacted against the Chinese to deny their citizenship, deny their participation, deny them job, to de and then force them to live in the Chinatown ghetto, nothing beyond, beyond the Chinatown ghetto. So that's a kind of, you know, uh, very antagonistic race, racial hostility to our Chinese, but with consequences also of, the, uh, of our foreign policy for China. And that, the, the new, the new China, the new Cold War against China actually is already showing signs of, you know, the, the revival of this anti-Chinese sentiment. Actually, you know, if we look back to the history of Chinese in America, you know, we knew exactly how to treat, for instance, Native Americans. We simply appropriated their land, occupied them, and then commit genocide against them. And then what's left of them, we put them in these godforsaken deserts in the Southwest of the United States. We also knew how to treat Black I mean, African Americans because we brought them in, from Africa in chain and we kept them in chain for hundreds of years. And in spite of the Civil War and emancipation, the Jim Crow law replacing that and kept them completely under, under submission, subservient role in our society. And, in, and only after a hundred years, after the so-called reconstruction after the Civil War, that we have the new civil rights movement. And very many important civil rights law were passed to, to achieve equality and opportunity for African-American and other minorities. So we knew how to treat, treat, you know, treat African-Americans. We knew how to treat Native Americans. 
But the Chinese presented a new problem because Chinese were not indigenous people like the Indians were, and Chinese were not brought into the United States as slaves. And so the only way that we, we can do it was to come up with the whole idea of exclusion. That's why exclusion actually defines the experience of Chinese in the United States. And you had all these exclusion laws, and then we, ex you know, uh, from immigration, you know, the, the uh, Trump's mo Muslim ban was really an old policy taken out of the, uh, you know, Chinese exclusion law. And uh, so Chinese Americans now suddenly became, you know, um, an enemy, especially during the old Cold War, you know, during the period of McCarthyism, Chinese were declared enemy number one, even though Chinese Americans had nothing to do with our hostility, you know, our conflict with, with the Soviet Union and China being seen as part of it. But because we saw China being part of that, we got into a Korean War and we got into very violent and costly Vietnam War. Why? Because we think of, we consider China to be expansionist and attempting to take over uh, Southeast Asia when in fact it was just a figment of our imagination. Now the same thing is happening now under the new Cold War. We think that the Chinese spies everywhere. In fact, being Chinese Americans is synonymous with theft, espionage, and treason. And this is why there is so much widespread persecution, discrimination, and prosecution, especially among Chinese American scientists and engineers. So let me just stop here and let uh, the other people take over, uh, especially to talk about you know, the, the new McCarthyism. Great, thank you so much, Professor Ling Chi Wang for your historical framing, the context of pivot to Asia and the new Cold War, and especially about how this affects the relations against Chinese and Asian Americans. We're very happy to have your expertise kick us off on this discussion. Now, uh, Judge Lillian Singh, you are the first Asian American female judge in Northern California. You are a passionate advocate of justice and civil rights. And in 2015, you retired as a judge to install the Comfort Women Memorial in San Francisco, and you are currently the co-chair of the Comfort Women Justice Coalition. We understand that as an attorney, before you became a judge, you presented uh, Chinese in the U.S. who have been victims of the McCarthy era. Now that McCarthyism is again rearing its ugly head, can you comment on that and how should Chinese Americans deal with this as a group now? Um, and also, as a uh, I'm sure you've seen a recent poll shows that a large number of Americans after years of China bashing in the media and by the Trump administration um, have a highly unfavorable view towards China. How does this impact the way Chinese Americans are being viewed? First of all, I want to say it is so good to listen to Professor Lin Chi Wang. He's always so informative, so knowledgeable, and is such a great inspiration to me. So thank you, Lin Chi. I'd like to follow up on Professor Lin Chi Wang's theme on how foreign policies dictate domestic consequences and guilt by association. It was during the Cold War, the first Cold War, that McCarthyism first raised its ugly head. Senator Joseph McCarthy was obsessed with hunting down communist sympathizers. At that time, the foreign policy was America and communist Russia were enemies. And by definition, anything communism is a threat to United States security. Chinese is a communist country and therefore China became United States number one enemy. So anything connected with China is considered dangerous. Of course, most Chinese Americans have families in China, have relatives and friends in China. So Guilt by association made Chinese Americans as potential enemies of this country. FBI would raid uh, Chinese homes without notice. And there was a social club called Mingqing. It means 
youth citizens, where kids 13, 14 would get together to learn English, Chinese, and American arts and culture, including singing Chinese songs. That was considered suspicious. The FBI raided the club and arrested many of them. Some of them lost their citizenships and their passports. In the 70s, they became my clients. Some of them became my clients. I helped them restore their citizenships, but I could never restore the pain that they went through and the indignities that they suffered. I think it impacted their lives forever. Now, we are again facing a new Cold War. And this time, again, the foreign policies is dictating our domestic consequences. On February 2018, the director of the FBI, Christopher Wray, issued a dire warning. The whole of Chinese society is a threat to the United States, and the Americans must step up to defend themselves. In ordinary parlance, it means all persons of Chinese American descent is in our whole society are to be distrusted and be regarded as potential spies. And all Americans must defend themselves against Chinese Americans. It is a we, they attitude. All Chinese Americans are potential enemies of we Americans in America, in every aspect of American society, whether it's in business, science, medicine, politics, academia, or government. That is extremely dangerous for us Chinese Americans. About two months ago, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo issued warnings for people associated with two civic nonprofit community-based organizations called U.S. Friendship Association and Chinese Council for the Peaceful Reunification of Taiwan as being controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. By implications, these two organizations and their members throughout the United States are in fact considered as agents and tools of the Chinese Communist Party, representing the interests of China rather than the interests of the United States, which renders them susceptible to charges of espionage and treason. Like the Mingqing Club that I just mentioned, this again is guilt by association. All the members of the US-China Friendship Association and Chinese Council for Peaceful Reunification of Taiwan are now deemed guilty by association with the affiliation with their love for China, wanting to learn culture and establish friendship and reunification with China, which by the way, is official position of US policy. I'll go to that later. I want to emphasize another article that recently came up, which is an article in the Newsweek magazine that was published on October 26, 2020. Newsweek printed a long cover story linking 600 US Chinese groups to Chinese Communist Party influence. This cover story seems to even outdo what McCarthyism did in the 1950s. Just like the McCarthy era and communism, just like the McCarthy era, the article basically repeated the theme that China and communism go together. And China is the enemy and anyone who has any connection with China is a suspect and a potential spy. Again, it is guilt by association. It named over 600 groups with links to China, Chinese government and our Chinese Communist Party. This not only included social clubs and organizations in American society, universities and colleges and public schools, but surprisingly, some of the most prestigious elite Chinese Americans who belong to the Committee of 100 were also named. This is incredible. We really live in dangerous times. We Chinese Americans are deemed guilty by our mere association with China, which of course is prohibited by the US Constitution. The US Constitution and the Civil Rights Act of 1965 specifically deemed it unconstitutional to single out anyone 
because of our national origin and race. Our national origin, a lot of us were born in China, a lot of us were born in the United States, but regardless, because of our race, our complexion, we're deemed as suspects. You know, I'm proud to be American who loves America and the country of my ancestor, China. There's nothing un-American about loving China. There's pro-America and not un-America to want to build a better relationship between the United States and China and to continue to enhance U.S.-China friendship. What is wrong with promoting U.S.-China friendship? Isn't that the official position of America after the Shanghai Communique? Yes, that is still the official position of the United States foreign policy towards China. This is what President Nixon did in 1972 when he issued the Shanghai Communique. He said, it was in the interest of all nations for the United States and China to work together towards the normalization of their relationships. President Jimmy Carter on December 1978 announced official one China policy between the United States and the People's Republic of China. It ended US official recognition of Taiwan. This is still our official US policy towards China. And you know what? I'm proud to say that Judge Julie Tay and I are very comfortable in working on these missions. I was chosen to represent the Chinese community in welcoming the ping pong players in the 1970s, when we called the ping pong diplomacy that helped and was a key turning point in improving US-China relationships. Last year, 2019, United States and China celebrated its 40th anniversary of the normalization of the US-China relationship. My good friend, Judge Yuli Tan was MC in that celebration. I was a keynote speaker. We are proud to talk about the 40 years of the win-win policy for both the United States and China. Both countries profited in the economic boom of the normalization and friendship between the United States and China. You know, we are not being disloyal to the United States because of that. There is nothing dangerous or suspicious of what we do. We Chinese Americans are actually in the best situation to educate the public, to tell the American people about why we Chinese Americans believe and why all Americans should believe that it is in the best interest of America to have a better relationship with China. So I refuse to allow people like Mr. Pompeo, Christopher Ray control my narrative as to who Chinese Americans, what Chinese Americans are, who we are, and what we're allowed to do. McCarthyism must never allow to, again, rise its ugly head in our community. It is rising, but this time we are going to stamp it out. We are going to be the proactive narrator of what the truth of US-China relationship is. And this is why I'm so proud to speak in this forum with esteemed American patriots like Professor Leng Chi Wang, Judge Julie Tang, Henry Durr, and George Ku. We are Americans of Chinese origin, but we are very loyal to the United States. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lillian. Um, you know, especially with your expertise. It is really rare that we get to hear and, and speak with someone who has done the work that you have done um, around representing folks who have been victims of this type of McCarthyism in the past. And I really appreciate you pointing out just the hypocrisy of Mike Pompeo and, and um, everything that we've seen and the deepening McCarthyist policies we're seeing today. Um, and thank you again for emphasizing this question of what is wrong with promoting friendship between these two countries. So again, thank you, Judge Singh. Um, 
Now we're going to move on to uh, Henry Durr. Henry, you were the executive director of the Chinese for Affirmative Action for more than two decades and also served as the deputy superintendent of public instruction at the California Department of Education, as well as the chairperson of the California Post-Secondary Education Commission and State Bar Legal Services Trust Fund Commission. You were also a commentator for the NPR affiliated KQED FM during the 90s, and you recently retired as a senior program officer at Four Freedom, uh, Four Freedom Funds, a national funders collaborative in support of immigrant rights groups across the country. You also co led the successful campaign for the new San Francisco City College Chinatown North Campus facility, which serves more than 6,500 adult immigrant students every semester. So, Henry, it is obvious you have spent most of your professional career fighting for civil rights for immigrants as well as Chinese Americans. Can you tell us just a little bit more about the state of hate crimes against Asian Americans that have gone up since COVID-19? Thank you, Sheila, for inviting me to be part of this webinar. It is an honor to be with my fellow panelists, uh, Ling Chi Wong, uh, Lillian Singh, George Ku, and Julie Tang. These are individuals that have had the uh, honor and privilege of knowing and working with over these many, many decades. Um, I just want to put it out there uh, at the get-go that during the war in Vietnam, when I was much younger, during my college years, I was adamantly opposed to our country's involvement in the Vietnam War. It literally made no sense for, for me, for anyone, especially Chinese and Asian Americans, to be killing other Asians uh, during that time. Uh, and I uh, had to confront my draft board and I applied as a conscientious objector to war. And after a very long struggle, I was awarded my status of CO. For many decades now, I've been against all forms of military uh, interventions and wars and the like, because violence, physical violence is not a way to resolve problems and issues either in the world or within our country. I am extremely disturbed that the current administration is upping the sale of arms to Taiwan to countries in the Middle East and elsewhere in the world. These actions are recipe that will bring us to a precipice of engaging in actual physical conflict. And we cannot allow our country to engage in any kind of action that would lead us into war, including this Cold War that is unfolding before us between the United States and China. Because the buildup, the, the arms merchants and the military industrial complex, they're the only ones who are benefiting from these types of policies and actions by our government. So it is important that an organization like Pivot to Peace does the work that it is doing today and conducting this webinar so that we can have an ongoing conversation about what we can do to stop militarization, to stop the buildup of arms, and literally to stop any kind of physical conflict um, by the United States or by any country for that matter. As we well know, the coronavirus has affected millions of people around the world. And it, of course, has affected many, many people here in the United States, especially people of color who have lack of adequate access to health services, 
for low income people, for essential workers who have to work, who do not have the luxury of staying at home to work digitally. With this pandemic, as uh, the current co-executive director of Chinese for Affirmative Action, Cynthia Choi has pointed out, that the, pan the pandemic has exposed the pre-existing conditions of racism in our country. And that comment by Cynthia can not be uh, any more accurate than that. Because we now see all the disparities, social economic disparities that are afflicting the citizens of our country, especially the low income immigrants and people of color. And within the Chinese community, after the virus was uh, made itself aware in our country, already Chinese restaurants, Chinese businesses, and individuals were the victims of hateful speech, of actions that stereotype Chinese as being responsible for the coronavirus. Uh, there were rallies held by uh, Julie Tang and the Chinese Six Companies and others in Portsmouth Square very early on to say, don't hate Chinese, hate the virus, stop the virus. That's the enemy, not Chinese people. In spite of those early efforts to protest how Chinese were, Americans especially, were being perceived and treated in the United States, three organizations had the foresight to set up the Stop API Hate Tracker on the internet. And the three organizations were San Francisco State University, Chinese for Affirmative Action, an Asian uh, Pacific Policy and Planning Council in Los Angeles. We are indebted to these three entities for setting up this tracker to monitor hate violence that have unfolded since the pandemic flourished in mid-March in our country. When they set up this hate tracker in uh, mid-March until fall, over 2,700 individuals in 47 states and the, uh, and the District of Columbia reported hate incidents that they suffered and they experienced. And uh, these incidents that were reported range from being called racial slurs, being spat on or physically assaulted. In fact, 9% of the reported incidents were in the physical assault category. In, additionally, uh, other incidents included not being denied services, experiencing workplace discrimination, and uh, uh, incidents that are potential violations of civil rights. And then on a very personal basis, my own uh, wife, uh, Priscilla, experienced one of these incidents when she was shopping at Trader Joe's, where, the, where there were hateful words expressed to her because she was Chinese. So it does not make any difference whether we live in a area that is considered to be progressive or an area that might be considered to be the uh, middle of the road or moderate, uh, we are all uh, susceptible to the hateful rhetoric that has been coming out of the current administration in Washington, DC. Um, the three organizations, I think, have aptly characterized President Trump's rhetoric of calling the coronavirus, 
uh, the Chinese virus, as he is in fact the super spreader of racial hate in our country today. We would not have this level of reporting of hate incidents if our national leaders were to exercise leadership to calm the hate, to promote understanding, and to promote science about what we know and what we don't know about the coronavirus. Um, also, uh, the, uh, there is a professor by the name of Melissa Porha, uh, Porha at the University of Michigan who has studied tweets that have come out of the, during the presidential campaign from the Democrats, from the Republicans, from the presidential candidates, from senatorial candidates. Without going into all details, it is no surprise that the tweets that have been coming from the president and members of this party have been all hateful. Although Democrats have also um, uh, uh, issued tweets about China, it doesn't they did not necessarily fall in the category of racial scapegoating. So we need to be very careful and remind ourselves as Chinese Americans and our friends that what someone says matter, especially those who are leaders in our country. One very important finding that the three organizations have revealed in their tracking of these hate incidents is that more than at least 60% of those reporting these hateful incidents were not Chinese. They were non-Chinese. They were people who may be Asian of other ethnicities and other, or who may be perceived to be Chinese. So we need to be mindful that this type of hateful rhetoric against China, against Chinese Americans affect other people. And we really need to come together and understand that white supremacist language is dangerous. That white supremacy is not just against black folks or Jews who are conspiring to, to take control of world finances uh, in the world. White supremacist language and attitudes affect all people of color, including Chinese American. White supremacy also has this face of white nationalism. There's no question that the current administration has driven a white nationalist agenda during the last four years with regards to our nation's immigration policies. Without going into all the details, there is one executive order after another where the current administration is not only opposed to so-called uh, undocumented immigration, this administration is against legal immigration that has benefited people from Asia, from China, from India, from the Philippines, uh, diversity visas, benefiting people from uh, Africa. So this white nationalist agenda of the current administration has shut down family visas, made it more difficult. They have shut down student visas and the like. They have treated individuals who seek asylum into our country. They have kicked them to go back to uh, Mexico to wait, which is in horrible conditions. And of course, we know that the current administration has separated children from their parents. Unconscionable for a administration and political majority party that claims to be family oriented. 
So looking at the pandemic, we know that it has made no difference what educational attainment we have achieved as a community, what level of employment, what professions we have attained. And what is even more heartbreaking is the recorded number of hateful incidents that frontline workers in the health profession have had to endure and suffer. These are individuals who are trying to save lives, but they are targets and victims of hateful speech and of physical assaults. Um, we know that this environment that we are now going through, people are really being hurt. Recently, the New York Times just reported that a Japanese musician who came to the United States about a year ago to pursue his a, a jazz career in the United States was physically assaulted to the point where his arms and fingers were gravely injured. Why did he get assaulted in New York City? Well, he felt like it's because he's Asian that there was a racial hate element to it. So it is important that we coalesce and that we speak out. We don't know today exactly how Asian American voters voted in this election that we just had last week. But we do know from the American Election Eve poll, 72% of Asian Pacific respondents said that Trump did not, does not care about us and has been hostile towards the API community. And 80% of Asian respondents in this American Election Eve poll said that white supremacy is a major threat to our society. This level of awareness, I think, gives us hope. It gives us hope because as Lillian said, it is time for us to continue to speak out and to coalesce and not to be silent. I am very optimistic that when the election results are analyzed, that vast majorities of Asian American voters voted for science, they voted for truth, they voted for a plan to deal with the pandemic, a pandemic and they are uh, also voted against racism. And as President-elect Biden takes office, especially for those who voted for him, we need to hold him accountable and not fall into the trap of using any kind of anti-Chinese rhetoric or to pursue policies that will deepen this Cold War. We need to lower the rhetoric. And I, think, I believe that he wants to lower the rhetoric, but also we need to have action where we will treat China in a fair manner. I may have my own objections my own personal views about certain Chinese policies, but certainly my views in no way justify any type of Cold War against China. And we really need to coalesce and do everything we can to oppose any expansion of this Cold War against China, because it's dangerous for us as American, it's dangerous for Chinese people in China and for the entire world. Thank you so much, Henry, for um, your great explanation and for the work that you do. Um, thank you again for bringing our attention to the work around the Stop AAPI tracker and the rising anti-Chinese racism and as a consequence, anti-Asian uh, racism. Um, I too am concerned every day for the safety of my family members who many of whom are monolingual Chinese immigrants. Um, and again, thank you again for being a part of our program.
Um, so George Ku, uh, you are a retired international business advisor and was a one-time member of the Chinese service group at Deloitte. In 2014, you reached full-time retirement uh, when you stepped down as the board of director uh, of NYSE listed multinational integrated resort corporation. You are also a regular contributor to the online Asia Times um, news source on US-China relations. So uh, I wanna ask you, what do you think of the outcome of this year's elections? How do we think the new admi administration will deal with US-China relations? And what should we do as Americans to promote peace with China? Thank you, Sheila. Thank you for the pivot. Uh, peace to China organizers. It's, a, it's an honor to back clean up and bring the discussion that all three previous speakers brought up to a up-to-date uh, present-day context. So the good news about the election is that we no longer have to deal with irrational, uh, arbitrary, uh, um, xenophobic attitudes and thinking of the Trump administration. That's the good news. Not so good news is the difference between US and China is a bipartisan issue by the both parties. The Democrats criticize and attack China on the basis of human rights, which is really a false premise issue. When you think about, as Professor Lin Xi Wang had mentioned, China has brought up 850 million people out of poverty. They worked on all the remote areas to make sure they now can live above subsistence level. That is not an indicator of human rights abuse. Furthermore, the Ash Center of the Harvard Kennedy School has been doing a decade long survey of the Chinese people's attitude about their government. And it has, the approval reading has increased from 80 some percent to currently at 93 percent approval. Unheard of in our current context in the US. So let's stop the ideological battle and think about on the current present day basis, how do you make both, both sides win? And I just posted an article in the Asia Times that Biden must avoid the lose-lose confrontation with China. So let's look at the positive side of what we Americans get out of it if we collaborate with China. And one of the things we have to understand and accept is as Professor Lin Shi Wang mentioned, China is on the rise. They are the second largest economy. In the certain areas, they are stronger and better than we are. We gotta accept that and then go from there. So, <clears throat> Chinese investments, how can they be, be, be improve a better for us in, in the United States? Well, there is this xenophobic feeling that Chinese investment means they're here to steal from us, which is nonsense, because we all know that foreign investments into America, aside from investing in stocks and bonds, if they're here to invest in manufacturing facilities, it creates jobs. It creates jobs that may not have existed if you were only dependent on American investments because American investments seem to go all to Wall Street. Some examples. Hire has been here for a long, many, many years making appliances. They even took over the General Electric plant uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, Mitch McConnell's state. They saved, I don't know how many, the appliance park at GE would hire tens of thousands of people. They kept their job. China Construction America has been in this country for at least 25 years. They rebuilt the Alexander Hamilton Bridge north of Manhattan. They converted from a four lane highway into an eight lane bridge. It was a $407 million project that the New York State let out. 
it's the biggest project they ever have given. And guess what? They brought it in within budget, ahead of schedule, and they, the employees, the workers, and almost all of them are American workers. So what did you get out of it? You got a rebuilt project, infrastructure related, helped by the Chinese that would not have happened or at least much more. There is the, um, the subway coach project. The CRRC, which is a rolling stock rail company from China, they came, they set up two assembly plants, one in Chicago, one outside of Boston, to assemble modern subway coaches for LA, Chicago, Philadelphia, and Boston. The advantage is that their bids were at least 20% cheaper than the competitive bids, and the competitive bids were not from U.S. producers because the U.S. no longer make the coaches. It has more than 60% local content because all the inside of the coaches were made locally, direct, managed and directed by the Chinese management. It meant 150 jobs at each location, Chicago as well as um, Boston area. And this success, they've been supplying the coaches all along now. The success meant that they were interested in seeing how they could supply the same for New York, one of the oldest subway systems and needs badly replacement, and Washington DC, but then um, US Congress stepped in. Our Senator leader, Schomer of the Democratic Party says, wait a minute, the Chinese could be using the coaches to spy on us. Can you imagine the Chinese listening in on a daily conversation in the subway coach? Hi, Joe, how are you doing? You think the Yankees are going to win this year? That's big, big time intelligence, I tell you. So one of the lessons is that if you can see eye to eye to work together, there's a mutual benefit. Climate change. Both Xi Jinping and President-elect Biden are very much in favor of getting into the climate change because the world needs the two biggest economy to work together on this. This is an easy one. The Chinese actually have made advances in solar and in wind energy. Those companies could easily come in here in the U.S., build plants here to help the U.S turned into green energy. Again, those mean jobs locally, even though it's managed by the Chinese. So we have to accept that they can bring certain benefits to the, to the party. So let's look at the one more item. Because of the COVID um, virus, China, because they were able to, willing to pay the bill and control ahead of time, they actually are turning around and they're the only major country, except for maybe Vietnam, have turned their economy around. China is now considered the economic engine to drive the economy globally. That, what does that mean? That means that the U.S., if they want to get some help in turning the U.S. economy around, they have to work with China. And in what way? Well, one of the obvious way is that the Chinese are importing about a $2 trillion annual market for imports. And there is room in there for American products, not just the soybeans and, and, and lobsters and other things. There's many more things that the U.S. incoming government can concentrate on, on how to sell to China, how to locate the base in China. The proof, American companies are already there. General Motors, Coca-Cola, you name them. They are making more money in China to cover the losses that they have in the rest of the world. That's another benefit for working together because China's consumer market is the biggest one already and they're growing. So this is how 
is my piece that I wrote in my in Asia Times is this is how both sides can win. You have to work and in the game theory, you have to move from the lose-lose quadrant, which is the um, southwest quadrant, and move up to the northeast quadrant where both parties can win. That's the current context. We just have to get over the ideological battle that Americans seem to have. Now, it's not gonna be an easy job because both parties have worked so hard to position China as the adversary, the enemy, the Cold War, Cold War uh, uh, rival to the point that the American people are convinced, have a very strong negative feeling about it. So it really is going to be up to the Biden administration to start turning it around. And perhaps when they start turning it around, they don't just automatically say we're buddies with China. They start turning around by explaining why certain steps along the way is positive and good for the American people. Now, what can we do as Chinese Americans to help rectify the situation? I think the forum that we're having, the webinar that we're having, is in that direction. It's a positive direction. We have to speak up, as Henry said. We need to stand up and explain. Now, I am first generation immigrant. I was 11 when I came over here. And I truly can say I lived the American dream. It was a wonderful 50, 60 years after I've been here. And I like to tell people that I live in the best of two worlds. I'm a proud American, I'm a loyal American, but I'm proud of my Chinese culture and background and upbringing. And I really feel that it's my job to try to explain China to the US and vice versa. What I don't wanna see is to see the two countries that has my affection and my love to go into battle and go into war. That is a truly a lose-lose situation and a lose-lose outcome that we will regret it more than anything else. My grandkids will regret it. So this is what we have to continue to do and strive. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. Um, I really appreciate your explanation of, of what we have to gain for collaboration with China, especially as we're facing impending uh, climate catastrophe, as we're still in a global pandemic. Um, and, you know, if people get a chance, please definitely go on to Asia Times and check out some of the articles George has written. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. So for our final speaker, I'd like to bring up Julie Tang. Julie, you are a retired judge of the San Francisco Superior Court and previously an assistant district attorney in San Francisco. You, along with Judge Lillian Singh, who spoke earlier, co-founded the Comfort Women Justice Coalition and built the Comfort Women Memorial in San Francisco. You also co-founded the Rape of Nanjing Redress Coalition in 1998. This year, you co-founded this organization, Pivot to Peace. So I have our final question for you today. As a co-founder of Pivot to Peace, can you explain why Pivot to Peace was formed and why people should support this coalition? Thank you, Sheila. Pivot to Peace is an American peace organization founded in 2020 in response to the US-China Cold War. We are a rainbow coalition of Americans from various ethnic backgrounds and professions. We are Asians, Blacks, Caucasians, Muslims, and Latinos. Here is a slide showing some of our core members. Together, we believe the answer to a better future for America and for our children is to seek peaceful solutions with China and not war. This new Cold War has taken on a life of its own. It needs to end. That's why Pivot to Peace is working to educate and mobilize public opinions about the benefits of a policy that facilitates cooperation and mutual respect between the United States and China. Since March of this year, 
We have produced three webinars, including this one to domestic audience and the international community. We have also forged alliances with many national and local organizations that share our vision for peace and our common goal to end this Cold War. There is no doubt that US-China relationship is the most significant relationship impacting the future of US, China, and the world. In the last two years, we have seen such a deterioration in that relationship. It began with the Trump administration's aggressive confrontation with China in trade, technology, diplomacy, and information warfare. The economic impacts of these Cold War strategies to both countries are devastating. On the American side, Kamala Harris, our incoming vice president, said we lost the trade war and 300,000 manufacturing jobs, not to mention the many small businesses that had to close down due to the high tariffs. And aside from the pandemic, we have lost a great many opportunities for the many person-to-person -person exchanges between the United States and China. Due to US unilateral restrictions on immigration and tourism from China. For Chinese Americans, this is a matter of urgency. As Sheila said, not something we can look from afar. Chinese Americans from every spectrum of the society are worried. We worry about our personal safety from racially motivated violence. We worry as we witness Chinese scholars and science researchers suffer harassment from the FBI. And we worry that our constitutional rights to free speech rights to free assembly and association are being curtailed. Chinese Americans, as well as other people of color in the US, unlike Caucasian Americans, such as the Russian Americans and Jewish Americans during the last Cold War and height of anti-Semitic atmosphere, many of them changed their names and spoke only English to hide the ethnic origin to escape public scorn. I can speak for the Chinese, we have no escape. We look Chinese, we sound Chinese. On Sunday nights, you see us pack Chinese restaurants in large tables with a whole family from grandparents to children in tow. We celebrate Chinese New Year, but we also celebrate Thanksgiving and Christmas. And on July 4th, many Chinatowns throughout the US have their own fireworks. Now there's a dark cloud hovering over us because we are organically tied to US-China policies that could either benefit our well being or put us in jeopardy. With this new Cold War moving closer to a hot war, we are not the only ones seriously jeopardized. The whole United States is jeopardized. War is horrible. War kills. Our last World War II killed an estimated 85 million people in the world. Ultimately, we have to ask the question what price must Americans collectively have to pay? to maintain our number one position in the world? Or under what circumstances are we willing to go to war? Or better yet, can we ask the bigger question, the most important question in this paradigm? Do we have the monopoly for peace and prosperity? Or is it okay to share with the rest of the world? These are the reasons why organizations like Pivot to Peace exist to serve the community. We need to be well-informed, we need to be engaged, and we need to be loud. We need to tell all Americans that we all share the same values, peace and prosperity, and we need to get involved. I love the fact that Pivot to Peace is a microcosm of the United States, a true reflection of the people out there living, breathing the same air. We need to let our new leaders, Mr. Biden and Ms. Harris, who Judge Singh and I personally know, because Ms. Harris used to work in San Francisco as a district attorney. She even did a trial before Judge Singh. And we need to let them know to urge them to reset the relationship with China in a positive way. Stop this war path with China. Stop further division among nations. Stop putting our allies in Europe and in Asia in a bad position just, to, just because we ask them to choose sides between the United States and China. Let's go back to the table and we negotiate a deal that will end in a win-win situation with China and benefit the world. Please support our efforts for peace. Go to peacepivot.org and sign up as an endorser or donate to us. And also, would you support Code Pink's petition to Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to stop the Cold War with China? 
and sign on. I signed, I hope you will too. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Julie, for your closing comments. Um, and I completely agree, like every, all the speakers, you, you all have been just so moving and, and so informative. And once again, just thank you all. Uh, thank you all to all of our panelists for taking uh, the time out of your day to share your expertise with us um, and your knowledge. And as I said in the opening, it is so critical that when we're talking about US-China relations and the new Cold War, that we discuss the ramifications felt by the Chinese and Asian American community. This is not simply about two competing countries, right? There are uh, issues that will plague us here um, domestically as well. So we in Pivot to Peace feel honored that we were able to bring together uh, each and every one of you to speak. And we thank all of those who took the time out of their Saturday to tune in um, for this webinar. We wanna thank our sponsors, the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association of San Francisco and Chinese for affirmative action. Again, if you agree with what you've heard today um, on this webinar, on this panel, please consider signing our mission statement and sign up with us at peacepivot.org. And if you are able to donate, please consider doing so on our website. Follow us on Twitter at Peace Pivot and on Instagram at Pivot to Peace. Thank you again for tuning in with us and, and thank you once again for our panelists for being a part of this today.